Hello and welcome to the session on the contract and commercial law. Now for the next 50 minutes, uh, let's categorize our session into five components. So to begin with, uh, we shall start our session on the historical evolution of the modern contract law, which would be our part one. Part two would be on the juristic concepts of the contract. Now in this area, we'll uh, touch upon the elements of contract and the sources. Uh, part three would be on the general principles of contracts, uh, wherein uh, we'll focus on three uh, most important principles, that is formation of contracts, discharge of contracts, and remedies in the event of breach of contracts. Then we'll move on to part four, which is types of business and difference between them. Well, we have uh, uh, varied uh, types of businesses. To begin with, we have private limited company, then we'll move on to the limited liability partnership, then the general partnership, the concepts behind the general partnership, the sole proprietorship, and uh, we'll end the part with uh, an introduction and as well as the difference uh, of what one person company is in relation to the above four different businesses. Then we'll end our session with uh, a concept on corporate personality. In this part, we'll address two most important questions. One, what is corporate personality? And second, why have corporations been attributed with personality? So this is how we are going to uh, pan out the next 50 minutes. So let's begin with part one, which is the historical evolution of the modern contract law. Now, contract law is founded on the principle that individuals are the bearers of rights and they bargain with each other to get into contract to exchange goods and services. Now, the problem here is in abiding these agreements, there is a problem and that is it becomes a matter of individual discretion. Because if abiding these agreements becomes a matter of individual discretion, then the entire social and economic order founded on contracts would fall down. So therefore, state stepped in to recognize these agreements and to enforce them or give remedy to the aggrieved party. So therefore, contracts in all systems of law are founded on this very premise. People know a fair amount about contract and contract law. Uh, people enter into contracts every day without being even conscious of it. So let's say day-to-day -day facilities like taking a bus or buying a newspaper and using a mobile phone for that matter, all come to us through contracts. So therefore, in the case of people engaged in trade, commerce and industry, they do business by entering into contracts. So thus getting into contracts is essential to our society, which is based on transactions of goods and services. Contract law governs different aspects of contracts. Basically, these are the principles of contracts, such as formation, validity, discharge, and the remedies in the event of breach. So therefore, the law of contracts has developed over centuries and has had to transform itself so as to keep with economic, political and technological developments. Now the form in which the contract law is known today has its genesis uh, from the 19th century uh, in England with the Industrial Revolution. Now as a result of the Industrial Revolution, England got transformed from an agrarian society to a commercial industrial society. Now this brought about some basic changes. Mines, mills and factories sprang up for the manufacture and sale of goods. Now this agrarian order was to be substituted by a world order based on exchange. Now the courts were also called upon to settle on a much larger number of cases. The courts reworked some of the older ways of looking at contracts and founded the field of contract law as a well-integrated, coherent body of principles. Now, judges decided cases on the basis of reason, common sense, and the prevailing notions of justice, and started relying on prior judgments. Now, following similar judgments on similar types of matters, general reasoning and principles came to be formulated. Now, the courts subsequently followed these principles as the law. Now, through this process of precedence, a corpus of judge-made law came to be developed. 
Now, the judiciary made law as it was developed from the experiences and the practices of the common people was called common law. Now, the earliest common law to develop in the field of trade and commerce was the contract law. So, this was to be the basis of the business law. Now, as trade and commerce grew and expanded, business practices became specialized. Proportionate to this, the principles formulated by courts could also be grouped into different areas. Say, for instance, other specific forms of contracts and business relations to emerge were sale of goods, the carriage, finance, banking and insurance. Now, the courts developed the law on these areas on the foundation of the contract law. Now, hence, contract law became the foundation of all the business laws. So, therefore, contract law is the product of the business civilization. Now, it will not be found in any significant degree in a non-commercial societies. Like the most primitive societies have other ways of enforcing the commitments of individuals, say for example, through the ties of kinship or by the authority of the religion. So therefore, to conclude, a true law of contracts, that is of unenforceable promises, implies the development of a market economy. Now, where a commitment's value is not seen to vary with time. So therefore, in a market economy, a person may seek a commitment today to guard against a change in the value tomorrow. We now move on to part two, uh, which is the juristic concept of the contract. Now, here we will we'll, uh, try and look into two most important things. One is the elements of contract and the second being the sources. Now, before we proceed to that point, uh, let's address the rights which are created by the law of contract. Now, the contract law creates two sets of rights. One, rights in personam and the other, rights in rem. Now, rights in rem are available against the whole world, uh, whereas, uh, where, whereas the rights in personam are available against or in respect of a particular person or persons or group of persons and not against the world at large. So therefore, the juristic concept of contract comprises of two constituent elements. One, obligation and second, agreement. Now, obligation means a legal tie, uh, which imposes upon a determinate person or persons the necessity of doing or abstaining from doing a definite act or acts. So therefore, the sources of obligations are many. They may have their origin in torts. They may also uh, result from the judgment of courts. They may also arise from quasi-contracts and obligations may also have the source in agreements. Now, uh, I just use the term quasi-contracts. So what are quasi-contracts? Well, under the Indian law, uh, these obligations are called certain relations resembling those created by the contracts. So therefore, a contract is by far a civil obligation. However, all obligations are not contracts. Uh, contract law does not cover the whole range of civil obligations as well. It confines itself to the enforcement of a voluntarily created civil obligations. Now, there are many obligations of civil nature, like those created by the acceptance of a trust or imposed by law, whose obligations may be actionable under the law of trust or the law of torts or under a statute, but they are very much outside the purview of contract. Similarly, the contract law does not deal with the whole range of agreements as well. Many agreements remain beyond the scope of contract law as they do not fulfill the requirements of a contract. More so over, there are some agreements which in literal sense appear to satisfy the basic requirements of a contract such as your offer, your acceptance, etc. But they still are not enforced as contracts because they do not catch the spirit of the contracts. So therefore, all promises are not enforceable by law as there is no intention to create the legal obligations 
such as your social agreements since these agreements do not give rise to any legal consequences so this illustrates that an agreement is quite a broader term than that of a contract so therefore a contract is an agreement but every agreement is not essentially a contract so therefore a question arises which could be asked how does a contract stand in relation to agreements and obligations well a uh, well renowned and respected legal scholar and a public servant sir john salmon says the law of contract is not the whole law of agreements nor is it the whole law of obligations it is the law of those agreements which create obligations and of those obligations which have the source in agreements moving on to part 3 the general principles of contracts the general principles of contracts can be studied under the following three broad heads uh, one the formation of contracts two the discharge of contracts and uh, three the remedies in the event of breach of contracts now the contract consists of two essential elements one an agreement and the other its enforceability so let's define what an agreement is so the term agreement is defined under the indian contract act of 1872 as every promise and uh, every set of promises forming consideration for each other so that's an agreement for you so when we look at the definition part of an agreement promise seems to be an essence to form an agreement so therefore a promise means when the person to whom the proposal is made signifies his assent thereto the proposal is said to be accepted the proposal when accepted becomes a promise so therefore the equation one could probably draw based on these definitions would be agreement is equal to offer or acceptance or a proposal plus acceptance now next element of the uh, contract is the enforceability part now it talks about enforceability by law so therefore an agreement to become a contract must give rise to a legal obligation which means duly enforceable by law so thus we can conclude that contract means accepted proposal or agreement plus the enforceability by law now apart from these two basic elements there are also other elements which is required to create a valid contract uh one there must be two parties that is one cannot contract with himself so therefore a contract involves at least two parties wherein one party makes the offer and the other part party accepts it so therefore a contract may be made by natural persons and by other persons having a legal existence example say companies or universities etc so it is necessary to remember that identity of the parties be ascertainable next parties must intend to create legal obligations now uh, some of this would be a social or domestic type of agreements which are not enforceable in the court of law and hence they do not result into contracts say for example well commonly stated example is a husband agreed to pay to his wife uh, a certain sum of maintenance every month while he was abroad now husband failed to pay the promised amount wife sued him for the recovery of the amount here in this case wife could not recover as it was a social agreement and the parties did not intend to create any legal relations next other formalities to be complied with in certain cases for example the if in if with regard to your contracts of insurance wherein the contract must be in specifically in writing certainty of meaning the agreement must be certain and not vague or indefinite and finally possibility of performance of an agreement the terms of the agreement should be capable of performance an agreement to do an impossible act in itself cannot be enforced so these are the uh, various elements which is required to create a valid contract now with this background let's move on with regard to the formation part of the contract now on the basis of formation there are four types of contract one express contract now when the terms of the contracts are expressly stated by words or in written form it's known as your express contracts 
Next, your implied contracts. Well, these contracts uh, come into existence by implications. Most often, the implication is by law or by an action. Now, there is another form of contract which is called as tacit contract. It is more of an implied contract. The word tacit means silent. Now, tacit contracts are those that are inferred through the conduct of the parties without any words spoken or written. So, it is no separate form of a contract but very much falls within the ambit of the implied contracts. Then we have something called as quasi-contracts. A quasi-contract is not an actual contract but it resembles a contract. Uh, it is created by law which uh, under certain circumstances, uh, the law creates and enforces legal rights and obligations when no real contract exists. Now, such obligations are actually known as uh, quasi-contracts. Then finally, there is something called as e-contracts. Now, when a contract is entered into by two or more parties using electronic means, such as say emails, is known as e-commerce contracts. Now, in electronic commerce, different parties or persons create networks which are linked to other networks through EDI, which is your electronic data interchange. Now, this helps in doing business transactions using electronic mode. Now, these are known as EDI contracts or it can also be called as cyber contracts or it could also be called as your mouse click contracts. Now, with this background, let's move on to the discharge part of the contract. Now, a contract may be discharged in various ways. Uh, let's have a look at few of the ways as to how it could be discharged to begin with. Uh, it could be discharged by performance. Now, discharge by performance will take place when there is either actual performance or there is an attempted performance. So, what is an actual performance? Well, it takes place when the contract, uh, the parties to the contract fulfill the obligations within the time and the manner prescribed in the contract. So, therefore, in an attempted uh, performance, uh, the promiser offers to perform his part but the promisee refuses to accept his part. Now, this is, uh, uh, known, uh, this is also known as a tender. The second form of a discharge is by a mutual agreement. Now, here, discharge takes place when there is an alteration and remission or substitution or recession. It is also called as novation. Now, in all these cases, old contracts need not be performed which is nothing but your discharge by your mutual agreement. The third uh, element when it comes to the discharge of contract is discharge by the impossibility of performance. Now, a situation of impossibility may have existed at the time of uh, entering into contract or it, may have, it might have transpired subsequently. Now, when are the, when are the, what are the reasons or when can an impossibility arise? Well, an impossibility can arise when there is an unforeseen change in law. Next, it could be by due to uh, destruction of subject matter or it could also be due to the personal incapacity of the promiser or maybe by virtue of declaration of war. So, under all these uh, situations, uh, we could call it as discharge by the impossibility of performance. Next, discharge by lapse of time. Now, the performance of the contract has to be done within a certain prescribed time. That is, in other words, it should be performed before it is barred by the law of limitation. So, when the performance is not fulfilled within the stipulated time, then such aspects are called as discharge by the lapse of time. Next is discharge by operation of law. Now, here where the promiser dies or goes insolvent, then there is a discharge by the operation of law. And finally, uh, discharge by the breach of contract. Well, uh, where there is a default by one party from performing his part of contract on a due date, uh, then there is a breach of contract. Now, breach of contract can either be actual breach or an anticipatory breach. Now, where a person repudiates a contract before the uh, stipulated due date, then it is called as an anticipatory breach. In both the events, the party who has suffered injury is entitled for damages. Further, 
he is also discharged for performing his part of the contract. Now, now that we have seen the, the breach of contract, let us also see the various uh, damages which are available in the event of breach of contracts. Now, before we actually go and talk about the various aspects associated with claiming damages, let us try to distinguish between the liquidated damages and the penalty. Now, what are these liquidated damage and penalty? Now, well, liquidated damages are those which are imposed by way of compensation. But when you talk about penalty, it is uh, imposed by way of punishment. Now, as far as liquidated damages are concerned, it is an assessed amount of loss based on an actual or a probable calculation. But when it comes to penalty, it is not based on an actuals or probables. Uh, it is imposed uh, to prevent the parties from committing the breach. Now, apart from the claiming of damages for the breach of contracts as between the liquidated as well as the penalty, there are also other remedies which are available. For example, you have a recession of contract. Now here, where one party breaches the contract, uh, the other party can treat it as resigned. Now in this case, the other party is absolved of his obligation and is entitled to compensation for damages which he has suffered. So this is another remedy which is available in the event of breach of contract. So, next, uh, there is a suit which is called as suit upon quantum merut. Now the phrase quantum merut literally means as much as earned or according to the quantity of work done. Now a person who has begun, let's say a civil contract work and has to later stop the work because the other party has made the performance impossible. Now he is entitled to receive a compensation on this very principle which is the principle of quantum merit. Next there is another uh, uh, remedy which is in the form of suit for specific performance. Now where damages are not an adequate remedy in the case of say breach of contract then the court may in its discretion on a suit for a specific performance direct the party in breach to carry out his promise according to the terms of the contract. So moving on to part 4 uh, which is the different types of businesses. Now we shall look at different types of businesses exclusively from the eyes of uh, the Startup India campaign which was initiated by the government of India. So, there are a number of requirements uh, the government places on these businesses and sometimes they could be very confusing as well. So let's look at the various uh, businesses uh, which are best suited uh, to the start of India and also bring about the differences among these various businesses. So to begin with, we'll start off with private limited company. Now uh, startups and uh, growing companies uh, pick this popular business structure because uh, it allows the outside funding to be raised very easily. Now it limits the liabilities also on its shareholders and uh, enables them to offer uh, uh, ESOP which is an employee stock option to attract top talent. Now as these entities must hold board meetings and also file the annual returns with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs they tend to be viewed generally with more credibility than that of uh, the limited liability partnership or the or general partnership. So therefore, let's look at the features of this uh, private limited company. Now there, are, there is uh, five exclusive features which is associated uh, with, uh, with uh, the private limited company in relation to the startup India. Now fast growing businesses that will require funding from the venture capitalists need to register themselves as uh, private limited companies. Uh, this is because only private limited companies can make uh, them the shareholders that is the, the venture capitalist as the shareholders and offer them a seat on the uh, board. Further, LLPs would require investors to be partners and the one person companies cannot accommodate these additional shareholders. So hence, for such a scenario wherein the entities are required with uh, raising funds, then the private limited company would be pro would probably be a, a good idea. Next is your limited liability concept. Now, businesses often need to borrow money. 
uh, in structures such as general partnership uh, partners are personally liable for all the debts they raise so if it cannot be repaid by the business then the partners would have to sell uh, their personal possessions to do so so in a private limited company uh, only the amount invested in uh, starting the business would be lost so the director's uh, personal property would always be safe third is your startup cost now a private limited company uh, could say cost around uh, say 8000 rupees to start at the very best or uh, this mind you this excludes your professional fees but however this will be slightly higher in some states say states like kerala punjab and madhya pradesh so in particular so therefore you also need to have some sort of paid of capital which can be say at least rupees 5000 to begin with so to sum it up if you look at it the annual compliance cost will hover somewhere around rupees 13000 next is the uh, the requirement of greater compliance now in exchange for the convenience of easily accommodating the funding part the private limited company set up needs to meet the demands of the ministry of corporate affairs now these range from the statutory audit annual filing with the registrar of the companies annual submission of your income tax returns as well as quarterly board meetings the filing of minutes also of these meetings and uh, furthermore so if your business isn't yet uh, geared up to meet all these requirements you may want to wait uh, while you know you jump into registering yourself into a private limited company next is of course from the tax perspective there are few tax advantages now the private limited company is assumed to have many tax advantages as is the first very basic assumptions uh, which is there under the income tax statute but this is not actually the case uh, there are some industry specific advantages which is provided for but uh, taxes are to be paid at a flat rate on the profits then you have this the dividend distribution tax which is applicable to the private companies as does your minimum alternative tax so therefore if you're looking for the structure with the lowest tax burden then probably limited liability partnership offers some better benefits now the second form of business is, is the limited liability partnership a relatively cheaper approach uh, to incorporate as compared to the private uh, limited company and uh, requires a very fewer compliances its main improvement over general partnership is that it limits the liabilities of its partners uh, to their contributions to the business and offers each partner protection from negligence misdeeds or incompetence of the other partners now what are the features of the limited liability company to begin with the startup cost now it is much cheaper than starting a private limited company with a government fees of about rupees 5000 so there is no paid up capital and there is no compliance cost either next if you are running a business that's unlikely to require equity funding then you may want to register it as a limited liability partnership as it combines several benefits of a private limited company and that of the general partnerships now it has a limited liability like a private limited company and has a simpler structure like that of your general partnership next is your fewer compliances the ministry of corporate affairs has made or given uh, some concessions to the limited liability partnerships say for example an audit uh, needs to be performed only if your turnover is greater than rupees 40 lakhs or the paid up capital is more than rupees 25 lakhs furthermore whereas all structural changes need to be communicated to the registrar of companies in the case of private limited companies the requirements is minimal when it comes to the limited liability partnerships next the tax perspective now particularly if your business is earning rupees uh, 1 crore and over then the limited liability partnership offers some tax benefits now the tax surcharge that applies on companies uh, with a profits of rupees 1 crore and over apply to doesn't does not apply to the limited liability partnerships nor does your dividend distribution tax loans to partners are also not taxable as income under the limited liability partnership form of a business 
Next, of course, the number of partners because we are talking about the limited liability partnership. Now, there is no limit uh, to the number of partners there may be in the limited liability partnership. But uh, let's say you are building a large advertising agency, for example, you need not worry at all about any cap on the number of partners. Third is the third form of business is the general partnership. Now, a general partnership is a, a business structure in which two or more individuals manage and operate a business in accordance with the terms and ob objectives uh, which is set out in their partnership deed. Now, this structure is thought to have lost its relevance since the introduction of the limited liability partnership because uh, its partners have unlimited liability that is the partners uh, from the general partnership uh, kind of a business have unlimited liability which means that they are personally liable for the debts of the business. However, low costs, ease of setting up and minimal compliance requirements make it a very viable option for some such as home businesses that are unlikely, unlikely to take any debts and registration is also very optional as far as the general partnership is concerned. But with regard to the features, one problem or major drawback is that of the unlimited liability concept. So on account of this unlimited liability, the partners in the business are liable for all its debts. So this means that if for whatever reason a partner is unable to repay a bank loan, or is liable to pay a fine, uh, this can be recovered, is unable to repay the fine or this can be recovered from his or her personal possessions. So the bank, institution or supplier would have right over his or her jewellery, their house or car. So furthermore aside from ease of setting up of uh, business and minimal compliance, the partnership offers no benefits over that of the limited liability partnership. If one opts to register it, in which case it is an optional, uh, it may even not be cheaper. Therefore, unless one is running a very tiny business, let's say you offer a lunch pack services in your area and would like to set a profit ratio with your partner then you should not opt for a partnership. Next, easy to start. If you choose not to register your partnership firm, all you need to get started off is a partnership deed and which you can have ready say in about two to four working days. Even registration for that matter can be completed in a day or so once you have the appointment with the registrar. Now, as compared with the private limited company or that of your limited liability partnership, the procedure for setting up is much simpler. And finally, it is also relatively inexpensive. How? Well, a general partnership is cheaper to start off in comparison to your limited liability partnership and even over the long term, thanks to the minimal compliance requirements. Further, you would not need to hire an auditor and that is why Despite its shortcomings, home businesses may opt for it. So moving on to the fourth uh, type of business, which is your sole proprietorship. Now a, a sole proprietorship is a business that is owned and managed by a single person. You could have one up and running, say in a matter of 10 days, which makes it very popular among the unorganized sector, particularly the small traders and merchants. Now there is no such thing as registration. Proprietorships are recognized by other registrations such as your service or your sales tax registrations. So therefore the features of uh, sole proprietorship could be twofold. One again the concept of unlimited liability. Well just as your partnership a sole proprietorship has no separate existence. So therefore all the debts can only be recovered from the sole proprietor. Therefore the owner has unlimited liability with regard to all the debts. This should heavily discourage any risk taking which means that it's suited to only small businesses. Now if you plan on running a business that requires a loan or may end up paying penalties, fines or compensation, it's best you look into registering for the one person companies. Next feature is of course it's easy to start. There is no separate registration procedures when it comes to the proprietorships. All you need is a government registration which is relevant to your business. If you are selling goods online 
For example, a proprietor would only need a sales tax registration. So therefore, starting up a sole proprietorship is relatively easy. And finally, uh, one popular or uh, uh, rather say newly introduced, introduced or a strongly improved version of the sole proprietorship is your one person company. Now the constitution of a one person company was recently introduced. Now it gives a very uh, single promoter a full control over the company while limiting his or her liability to the contributors of the business. Now this person will be the only director and the shareholder. Of course, there is a nominee director as well, but with no power until the original director is incapable of entering into contracts. Hence, there is no scope of raising equity funding or even offering uh, employee stock options. So the features are again uh, uh, fourfold in nature. One, a big improvement over the sole proprietorship firm, given that your liability is limited. The one person company is meant for uh, solo entrepreneurs. However, do note that if the revenue goes over 2 crores and the paid up capital is over 50 lakhs, then it needs to be compulsorily converted into a private limited company. Furthermore, Given that there must be a nominee director uh, to enable a perpetual existence of your one person company, you may as well consider starting a private limited company which will also have the flexibility of raising the funds. The next feature under the one person company is your high compliance requirements. Now while there are no board meetings, you will be required to conduct a statutory audit, submit annual and IT returns and comply with the various requirements of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. The third uh, feature under this business is your, of course, the tax advantage. You have a minimal tax advantage. The one person company, it's popularly called as OPC. So the OPC, like that of your private limited company, has some industry specific advantages. But taxes again are to be paid at a very flat rate on profits. The dividend distribution tax also applies as does that of your uh, minimum alternative tax, the MAT provisions. Now, if you're looking for a structure with the lowest tax burden, then the limited liability partnership does offer some better benefits in comparison to that of your one person company. And the final benefit under this one person company form of a business is your startup cost. Now, nearly it is as the same as the private limited company, but uh, with the government fees, government fees with uh, as little as say rupees 7,000. However, this will change for uh, different states, say for example, the states of Kerala, Punjab and Madhya Pradesh in particular, where the fees are much higher. We now move on to part five of our session, which is the corporate personality. Now, what is corporate personality. Corporate personality is a fiction of law. It is an artificial personality which is given to the corporation whereby certain rights and duties are attributed to it. This doctrine of corporate personality was approved for the very first time in a leading case called Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited in the year 1897 which held that a corporation has a personality of its own which is quite different and distinct from that of the members who constitute it. So what is the definition of company here under the Companies Act of 2013? The outcome of the Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited's case seems to be uh, the features of a corporation wherein the outcome seems to be attributed towards the characteristics of a corporation. But is this feature forming part of the definition of a company? Well, the Companies Act of 2013 does not define a company in terms of its features. Under Section 2, Subsection 20 of the Companies Act, it merely states that a company means a company formed and registered under this Act. That's it. That's the definition given under the Companies Act. So thus, a company is a voluntary association of persons registered under the Companies Act of 2013 or under any other previous acts in force 
with a separate legal entity which is quite distinct and different that from that of its members who constitute it. So therefore, what are the features of legal entity and corporate personality? Well, to begin with, all the assets of the company and the properties are held in the name of the company. The liabilities are incurred by the company in its own name. The members are not liable for the acts of the company, including the violation of any economic or labor laws. A company can enter into a contract on its own name with any person, including with the members. And the assets are vested with the company in its own right and not as the trustees of the members. Now, even though uh, the corporate personality was an outcome of a Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited case in the year 1897, there were various theories which highlighted the point on corporate personality. Well, there are theories which have attempted to describe the nature and authority of it. So let's begin with the theories uh, which have uh, tried to bring about a definition or meaning of a corporate personality. And to begin with, the very first theory is the fiction theory. Now, if you look at the fiction theory, it looks like that the Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited's case outcome was based on this particular theory. Now, what does the fiction theory talk about? Well, according to this theory, only human beings can be called as persons. So, the corporation is having a different personality as that of its members because the corporations cannot be considered to be the natural human beings and hence a, a legal entity concept is attached to the corporations. Now the theory propounds that the juristic persons has only a fictitious will and according to this theory the legal personality of the entities other than human beings is the result of a fiction. So this is what the fiction theory was and by far the Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited's case, the outcome of the case was dependent or attributed to this particular theory. Next is your concession theory. Now according to this theory, a juristic person is the creation of a state. The theory simply says that, that the corporate bodies are having a legal personality only to the extent granted to it by the state. So this theory is different from the fiction theory on the point that it identifies law with the state while fiction theory does not. Next is your realist theory. Now the realist theory is also known as the organic theory. This theory says that a corporation is having all the characteristics just like a natural person. So the supporters of this theory opines that the legal or a juristic person is really just like the human being. It further says that the juristic persons are not fictitious and also do not require the recognition of the state as we saw in the concession theory. Next theory was the group personality theory. Now this theory is also called as institutional theory. Now the theory has its basis in a collective outlook. It says that the individuals integrate into an association and become part of it. Thus it is believed that every collective group has real mind, the will and the power of action. So a corporation has the real existence and is independent of the fact that whether it is recognized by the state or not. And the final theory, uh, or rather most important theory pre-1897 was the symbolist theory. Now this theory is also known as a bracket theory. Now the theory says that the only persons who are having rights and duties are the members of the corporations. So the granting of a legal personality means putting a bracket on the members so that they can be treated as a single unit when a corporation is formed. Now based on these theories it can therefore be said that the modern definitions are all but the genesis of these five theories 
of corporate personality. Now, without these theories, it would have been very difficult to attribute a meaning and a definition to the word corporation and it would have become very vague too. So it is with the help of these theories that the modern definition of corporation implies that it is a separate legal entity having an identity of its own and perpetual succession. Well again, perpetual succession is another features of a corporation. Remember. A corporation is capable of surviving beyond the lives of those who are actually are its beneficiaries. Let's move on to the other characteristic features of a corporation because one of the features of a corporation was the corporate personality and it was an outcome of the Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited's case. What are the other features or the characteristics of a company? It's a voluntary association. Now the object of the formation of the company could be for business or it could be also for a non-business purposes. Now an association not for profit can also be registered as a company but it can be registered under section 8 of the Companies Act of 2013. It was or it used to be section 25 under the Companies Act of 1956. Now the word person includes here both natural persons as well as your legal person. Now the second feature of corporation could be it should be registered under the Companies Act. Yes, unlike in the case of sole proprietorship or partnership which we saw in the earlier sessions under different kinds of businesses, a company legally comes into existence only after incorporation under the Companies Act of 2013 or under any other previous acts in force and not just on filing the documents for incorporation. So remember on incorporation, the registrar of companies popularly called as the ROC shall issue a certificate of incorporation. We have also seen the other feature of the corporation that is your legal personality or your uh, corporate personality. Another most important characteristics of a corporation is the limited liability concepts. Now, the liability of the members to contribute to the company extends only to the extent of share capital which is taken by them. So, if the shares are say fully paid up, then there shall be no further liability on the part of the members. However, in case of partly paid up shares, then the members shall be personally liable to pay the unpaid amount. Now, the privilege of limited liability is one of the principal advantage of doing business under the corporate form of the organization. Even in the case of a company say limited by guarantee, there could also be a corporation which is limited by guarantee. Now the liability of the members will be limited to the extent of the amount of guarantee which is specified in the memorandum of association. Now there are two most important documents for a corporation. One, the memorandum, the other is the articles of association. Now, memorandum is more of a static in nature and uh, articles of association is very dynamic. I call it as dynamic because all the operational procedures and policies of a corporation are predominantly found under the articles of association of the company. Whereas, memorandum is more to do with the constitution of the company. Now, the next most important feature or the characteristics of a corporation is the perpetual succession. Now, a company is a juristic person and its life does not depend upon the life of its members. The membership of a company may keep changing from time to time, but that does not affect the company's continuity. The death or insolvency of an individual member does not in any way affect the corporate existence of the company. So thus members may come and members may go. This is a popular saying, the members may come and members may go, but the company goes on forever. So the company shall continue to exist till it is wound up or is declared defunct by the registrar in accordance with the provisions of the Companies Act. Remember, a company is created by a process of law and law alone can dissolve the companies. Next is your share capital. 
the entire capital of the company is divided into a certain specified number of units of equal value and each unit is called a share so thus the share capital of a company is always in fact divided into a certain number of shares having a, a specified nominal value now please remember the concept of share capital enables investors like you and me to participate in the ownership capital of the company so thus share capital enables the company to mobilize huge capital from lakhs of investors which would not be possible if we are trying to talk about say any other forms of business other than the corporate sectors or the other than the corporate kind of a business now another feature which is associated with the share capital is the transferability part that is the transferable part of the shares now once the shares are issued by a company it forms a permanent capital base of a company and the shares cannot be purchased back by a company yes there are certain provisions which is which addresses the issues on the buyback of shares but that is to be done with a lot of uh, procedures and limitations and various exceptional circumstances but having said that the normal understanding is that the shares cannot be purchased back by the company now why this is so because this protects the interest of the creditors next the shares of the company are again movable property and can be transferred from one person to another in the manner which is provided in the articles of association of the company so though the shares are transferable it is not a negotiable instrument under the negotiable instrument act now the transferability of shares this this specific feature of a company encourages investments of funds in the shares and the members can encash them at any point in time but however in the case of private companies certain restrictions are placed on the rights of a member to transfer the shares and please bear in mind this restriction is only applicable to the private limited companies and finally ownership and management now the management of a company is vested with the elected body of shareholders which is popularly called as the board of directors board of directors are predominantly considered as the brains of the company now once the management is vested with the board the shareholders cannot interfere in the day to day affairs of the company so the role and powers of the board and the members are very clearly specified in the companies act and they are not interchangeable powers at all however the powers of the board are always subject to the restrictions which is provided under the companies act of 2013 and of course the articles of association of the company with that we come to an end to our session next up is professor shivani rajesh who will be addressing on the topic law of torts thank you